Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Invasive Species Center webinar series. My name is David Dukevich, and I am an entomology technician at the Invasive Species Center, and I will be your moderator for today, tackling invasive forest pests through community science. Um, next slide. Uh, the Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization that mobilizes action against invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. Uh, we've got a lot of great uh, invasive species resources on our website, including uh, in invasive species species profiles, best management practice, and more. So click us. Uh, so check us out at invasivespeciescenter.ca. Uh, our newsletter, uh, you can also sign up for on our homepage. Uh, and we have a newsletter, a bi-weekly media scan, uh, and uh, it tells you all the events that are uh, taking place, including our upcoming webinars. Uh, the ISC has launched an invasive species training program uh, that offers uh, virtual courses on topics related to invasive species. We are currently have four courses available, uh, which focus on different forest invasives, but we'll be releasing more new content regularly, so stay tuned for that. Make sure to check out our website and sign up for regular updates on when these new courses are available. Uh, before we start today's webinar, um, I just want to uh, bring up a couple things. Uh, so there'll be time for questions at the end of today's webinar. So if you have any questions, please um, type them into the question box and I will uh, be able to read uh, them to the presenters. If you have any technical difficulties, similar to what we're having right now, uh, please uh, type, <laughs> sorry, please type them in the chat box and we'll be able to respond to them. Or you can email us, uh, which is the same place you get the register and we'll be able to solve them for you. Uh, but the text box is really the best place for that. Uh, we also have enabled closed caption, so you'll be able to follow along uh, that way. Um, and you can turn the closed caption on or off um, using the closed caption button on your taskbar. Lastly, uh, there will be a brief survey following the webinar. If you can take uh, some time to fill that out, we would really appreciate it. Uh, today's webinar uh, is titled Tackling Forest Invasive Pests Through Community Science. And I am pleased to introduce our speakers, uh, Mackenzie DiGasparo, as well as Darissa Vincentini. Um, so, um, sorry, let me pull this up. Uh, so Mackenzie, uh, as a forest uh, invasive specialist at the Invasive Species Center, Mackenzie works with government, industry, and community, and in communicating communications uh, to aid in the prevention, detection, and rapid response and management of invasive forest threats uh, that affect uh, the health and economy of Canada's forests. She leads uh, and aids in coordination of invasive um, for, of forest invasive programming for education, training, and resource development for priority threats such as beech leaf disease and oak wilt. Mackenzie is a university, uh, university of Ottawa and Seneca College alumni with seven years of experience working with forest pests and invasive species in Ontario. Uh, next to Darissa. Uh, Darissa is a community science coordinator and GIS lead. Uh, where she uh, coordinates invasive species education and outreach uh, innovations uh, program, uh, promoting uh, community action and uh, mi uh, mitigation, uh, or sorry, community action to mitigate the spread of invasive species in Canada. She also plays 
a supporting role in many projects involving the mapping of invasive species, indigenous support, and uh, engagements, invasive species plants, and forest pests. Darissa has a background in forest research as a forest research technician with both uh, the provincial and federal governments and holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology, as well as a certificate in uh, Geomatics from Algoma University. So I'm going to hand this over to uh, Mackenzie. Um, so yes, if you have any other questions, let me know and type them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, David. Sorry about the technical difficulties. That was me. I thought I was missing a slide and then it glitched on me. Anyways, uh, thanks for the introduction, David. Uh, Driss and I are really happy to be here today, taking advantage of our webinar series to tell you all about some of the community science initiatives that we have ongoing right now on some priority invasive pests in the province. So just an introduction to our community science program here at the ISC and a little bit about the importance of community science in terms of forest pest monitoring. So for uh, community science is really the public participation in scientific research. Uh, so we have a few programs in place that are helping to uh, encourage that public participation in the research. There's been a lot of research in the last several years uh, about the use of citizen science and community science integrating into forest pest management and monitoring and how it can be used as a really successful tool, uh, really in all aspects um, of prevention all the way through to management, regardless of where we are in the invasion curve. Um, and this can be used for a variety of different species as we'll talk about today. A lot of the new technologies <clears throat> also help with um, the use of community science, uh, things like smartphone applications, um, drones, um, all those kinds of things can help us uh, identify invasive species on the landscape and help community members to do so as well. Um, so this is just a figure that I wanted to include uh, from one of those research papers that I identified in the last slide. Um, and this really just identifies how community science relies on ecological knowledge as well as um, um, this social science aspect of getting people engaged and involved. Um, so we need public motivation to participate. Uh, there's skills that are needed for participation, like identification of uh, invasive plants or pests, and then the need for information. Uh, so you can see on this figure that um, there's different motivators and, and the skills required, and things kind of change depending on where we're at in the invasion curve. So if you look at the first curve and just motivation for making reports and re uh, recording invasive species, uh, the effect of your publicity, so kind of our job in communicating the impact and the importance, uh, the novelty of these species um, can impact um, the benefit of using citizen science. Uh, so that's a really important role of, of our jobs is kind of getting people engaged and getting them to know uh, the impact of these species. And then that's another impact of the motivation is what the impacts actually are of these species on the landscape. So if there's not a huge impact, there's not gonna be a huge benefit for using citizen science, uh, but the greater the extent of the impact on the landscape, the greater the extent of motivation for making reports. Uh, so you'll see that um, a lot of the species that we're focusing on in our community science project uh, pose a pretty great impact and a pretty great risk to the forests of Ontario. Um, and then we can focus on, on different species at different uh, points of invasion as well, whether they're species that aren't here yet uh, in the province that pose a new risk to the province or the country, are the focus of eradication efforts, or just maybe species that are, are spreading outside of their containment zones or their regulated areas. And I think you'll see examples of all three of those things today. And community science uh, initiatives like this play a huge part in raising public awareness, like I mentioned, but also creating educational op opportunities, uh, enabling civ uh, civic engagement and social license. Uh, it can contribute to policy development in the research that this community science uh, engages in and also can um, contribute to environmental management decisions. Oh, 
Okay, and then I will pass it over to Jarissa to talk about our first community science initiative. Awesome, thank you Mackenzie and thank you David for the introduction at the very beginning. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna start off with talking about the Hemlock Willia Deldred Monitoring Network, which is kind of one of our, our bigger and longer standing projects. Um, but before I kind of get into the project itself, just a little bit about what Hemlock Willia Deldred is or HWA is what you'll hear me refer to it as. Um, it is a sap sucking aphid like insect that infests and kills hemlock trees. It arrived in North America on ornamental trees around the mid 1900s. Um, and it's a very small insect. So it's less than 1.5 millimeters long. So you don't see the insect itself on the trees. Um, but we, what you can see and what you can look for is the waxy wool that they produce to kind of protect themselves and protect their eggs. So is these round woolly balls and they look like uh, mini cotton swabs almost, or like the tip of a, a Q-tip. Um, and this little insect can actually cause tree mortality within four to 15 years, depending on kind of other environmental factors and the health of the hemlock trees. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the network, HWA Monitoring Network, is coordinated by the Invasive Species Centre, but it's really a collaborative effort with partners at the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and the Canadian Forest Services. It was launched in the fall of 2022 uh, with the goal of increasing early detection of HWA outside of known distribution and also to complement existing surveillance being taken by the Canadian Food in uh, Inspection Agency and other partners. So this network really offers a unique opportunity for community members to become actively involved in monitoring and stewardship of their woodlots and allow them to manage their hemlocks easier the earlier that they could detect this pest in their forest. Uh, the network is built off of this trap design that you see in the bottom right, um, or the bottom two pictures. Um, oh, back one yep, yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, and it was developed by Dr. Charlene Partridge and Meg Sanders out of Grand Valley State University. Um, it's consisting of a 3D printed trap um, that includes kind of a base and then a top, and it holds four microscope slides that are dipped in petroleum jelly. Um, and this acts as an interception trap. So because HWA is so small, um, when it's in its mobile stage, it can get blown out of the trees by wind. And then as it falls, it'll hit the trap and then get stuck. So that's why it's an interception trap. Um, so the participants of this network were asked to set the trap out near or under a hemlock tree on their properties for two months um, and then periodically check it at least once a week to ensure it was still intact. Um, and then participants were also asked to use Canadian Food Inspection Agency's Survey 123 form, um, which is just a community science survey that anyone can fill out. Um, and you just check, you flip over the branch of a hemlock and then you can check for those white woolly ovisacs that I was talking about and then report whether you saw them or not. And that was another thing that we asked participants to do. Next slide. So why did we kind of want to do this in the first place? Well, hemlock woolly adelgid um, can be kind of difficult to find sometimes, at least early on. Uh, they can spread long distances by migratory, migratory birds. Um, which means it's often introduced to a new stand of hemlock in the crown where we don't really have much access to or it's very difficult to look for. Um, and then by the time you can find it lower in the crown or lower in the bowl of the tree, um, it's already been like quite well established and you might even start seeing tree mortality. So it's a little bit too late. Um, there is also limited knowledge of true distribution of hemlock, um, although we're, we're seeing some new kind of innovations with uh, remote sensing now. Um, but this project also gives us kind of access to that knowledge on private property, um, especially in southern Ontario, where it is primarily private land. There are also limits to kind of capital and resources from our partners um, with having to split their resources amongst other pest pressures that they're seeing across landscape and other things that they have to keep an eye out for and surveillance. Um, and then also there are, there are other tools for monitoring HWA, but they can be labor intensive like ball sampling um, or require expertise like sticky traps and visual sampling to be able to actually identify HWA. Whereas the traps that we use, that 3D printed trap, um, is a great option for community scientists because they don't have to be the experts themselves. 
Next slide. There we go. <laughs> so what did we do or what do we do? First, we kind of recruit some volunteers and we send out the uh, kits to them. And that kit includes the trap itself, some hardware to set it up, um, so two tubes that have two microscope slides in each of them, so four microscope slides each, um, two sets of gloves so that they can be sanitary, setting it up and taking it down to prevent contamination, and then a protocol document in a field sheet and a return mailing slip. And then uh, once they receive their kits, they can go out to their field site and set up their trap. Once they're on site, the trap takes about five minutes, if even, to actually set up. So it's very easy for community members. The longest time commitment is just getting to and from the site, depending on where it is. Um, and then they leave it there for two months and just go back and check it every once in a while to make sure that it's still intact and it hasn't fallen over or hasn't been tampered with or anything like that. And then they pick it up in June. So that April to June time period is when HWA is in its crawler phase. And that is the kind of the mobile stage of this insect. After that, it's sessile for the rest of the year. Um, then they go back, they collect their samples, they place those microscope slides back in those tubes and they send those tubes back to us. Um, and then they can sanitize their trap and store it to set up uh, next year. Once we receive all of the samples uh, ourselves, along with partners at Canadian Food, no, sorry, uh, Canadian Forest Service, um, visually an analyze those slides for the crawlers, the mobile life stage under a microscope. Um, and in the picture there, all of the kind of like black specks are HWA, <laughs> um, just to give you an idea of how small these, these guys are. Um, and then after we look at them under a microscope slide, we actually can scrape all that petroleum jelly off into smaller tubes and send that those to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for eDNA or molecular analysis. So that's kind of like um, an innovative part to the, using this tool is that we're able to first look for the adelgids themselves, but then also look for environmental DNA. And if you're unsure what that is, it is DNA that is shed into the environment by living organisms. And it can be something like for the insects, it could be wool, it could be feces, it could be a piece of a wing or a piece of a, a leg or something like that. Um, so we'd be looking for those trace uh, DNA instead of the insect itself. So it's kind of like an added um, tool of this, this trap. Next slide. So in 2023, we launched our pilot um, and we set up 50 traps or we deployed 50 traps and had 50 volunteers. Um, we received 44 samples back. And that is one thing I will note with community science is you don't always receive all of your samples back um, because they are volunteers. They're doing this voluntarily. They're not paid to do it. And they also aren't maybe trained and things come up. So I think 44 out of 50 was a really great, great number for our pilot year. Um, through visual analysis, we had two suspect positives, um, and we ident or notified CFA immediately, and they went and kind of did a ground survey at both of those sites. One was confirmed on site, and the other one was not. The one that was not, um, there was only a single individual on the slides, and we think that the trap was installed upside down as well. So, um, that might have limited the amount of adelgid that we were able to pick up, or because it was installed upside down, that individual was kind of smushed into the petroleum jelly a bit more. So it was, uh, it could also be a lookalike that wasn't adelgid. Um, so uh, year one, we did end up with one confirmed uh, new detection of HWA, which is unfortunate for the spread of HWA, but it did verify that this works um, in terms of community science, in terms of monitoring HWA and finding it on the landscape. Um, so that did work out for us in that way. Um, so the next year we were able to send out a an additional 50 traps. So we have 100 set up in Ontario this year. And then we were also able to expand into other provinces as well. So we had 15 in PEI, 15 in Nova Scotia and five traps in Quebec. Um, so far, we have no suspect detections from visual analysis of the slides, but we are still de uh, pending on the eDNA results. Next slide. 
And this is just a map to kind of give you an idea of where we did target. Like I said, we were looking for areas of kind of past where we know HWA is, but we wanted still high risk areas. So within the area of where HWA might end up. So the kind of yellow diamonds are um, people who set up the traps for both 2023 and 2024. The red diamonds are where the traps were removed between 2023 and 2024. So they they participated last year, but did not continue to participate, whether it be for their own reasons or because there was that positive detection. Um, and then the green dots were uh, where we set up or we had new volunteers for 2024 who will continue monitoring next year as well. Next slide. So lastly, kind of some of our next steps, um, you know, we've, it has worked as a broad scale monitoring um, program using community science uh, to look for the HWA on the landscape and, you know, uh, the like increase early detection on the landscape. Um, but we're gonna continue to build that toolkit of resources, um, working with community scientists, we really wanna make sure that's accessible so that anyone can participate. So we're gonna increase some of the, the resources visual uh, and include more visuals, um, things that make it easier for anyone with no expertise um, to participate. We're gonna continue to identify and fill gaps and offer new tools for land managers to improve monitoring as well. So not just within this trap, like using these traps, but other tools as well. Um, we're hoping to continue to increase the number of traps on the landscape um, in new locations in following years. And this will also depend on if there are any new detections as well that might gauge where we um, decide to target. And then we're also closely observing research to continue adapting methods. So this includes research from Dr. Charlene Partridge's lab on um, kind of quantifying infestation levels from the eDNA, as well as research from Dr. Chris McQuarrie's lab on phenology. So we can kind of refine that timing window of when the traps could be set up. And then also investigate methods to use maybe visual assessment only. And the reason for that is just because eDNA can be very expensive. Um, so we want to see if there are other ways that we can use these traps, still use community science, um, but, you know, maybe adjust methods that way as well. Um, if you're looking to learn more about the HWA Monitoring Network and any of the programs we talk about, you can find them on our website through the uh, Community Science Program, but there's a link there as well directly to this network. And then that Survey123 form that I talked about through CFAA, if you scan this QR code, it will uh, link you to that form uh, just on the web. But if you download Survey123, you can also have the form on your phone as well. So whenever you're outside just enjoying the outdoors, you can check Hemlock for HWA and contribute to com community science. And I'll pass it back to Mackenzie. Thank you, Drissa. And again, I think I'm just having a lag between slides here. So sorry about the delays, but we'll see if I can make it work for me. Okay, so we're, I'm going to talk about two community science projects. Um, one on emerald ash borer, this is a new project, and then on a species that is kind of moving outside of that containment zone, like we, I talked about in, in my first slides there. Um, and then next, I'm going to be talking about beech leaf disease. Um, so this new emerald ash borer project, it's a new three-year project um, that we're starting this year to increase public awareness on the impacts of emerald ash borer, and also the importance of genetic seed diversity for ash species. And we're hoping to continue to work with partners to support the long-term ash viability in Ontario through community science seed collection. Um, so as I mentioned, this is a three-year project that aims to inspire, empower, and motivate a province-wide network of volunteers to scout, map, and collect seeds from uh, living and remaining black ash trees on the landscape. Um, a few things that we're doing to support this project are to learn from Indigenous communities on the impacts of emerald ash borer on a cultural species like black ash. Um, we've already attended the Northern Ontario First Nations Environmental Conference and are looking to continue this learning through conversations with other existing First Nations partners. Uh, we've also developed a new fact sheet that's going to be available soon in both digital and print formats on um, the importance of emerald or importance of black ash and the impacts of emerald ash borer on that. 
And then we're working to coordinate and train that volunteer network. So we're hosting our first workshop early in November uh, in Sudbury, Ontario. I'm going to have uh, some more information on that in the next slide. Um, but through these volunteer training sessions, we're looking to uh, train these volunteers on a black ash identification, seed collection and branch sampling, and also on the impacts of emerald ash borer and that importance of protecting these trees on the landscape. We'll also be developing um, some quick reference guides for these volunteers on seed collection branch sampling so they can have some easy go-to reference guides uh, to look out for when they're out on the landscape. And we're also creating kind of a, a hub for these volunteers, a, a new web page uh, that will be titled Mitigating Impacts of EAB that will be coming soon. And this project is supported through the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. And we're working with um, the National Tree Seed Centre, as well as the Ontario uh, Research Forest Research Institute uh, on this project. So how can you get involved? We have this volunteer training workshop that I mentioned. Uh, registration is not out yet, but it will be coming out soon and in kind of the coming week or so. Um, so this workshop is gonna be taking place at Science North in Sudbury. Um, on Saturday, November 2nd. And as I mentioned, we'll be learning kind of the, the latest and greatest information on emerald ash borer and ongoing uh, black ash projects. And this will be our first training workshop on that seed and branch sample collection. Um, there will be an, a field demonstration for this as well and lunch and refreshments will be provided. Uh, so if you're interested in joining this community science initiative, um, we're targeting our first couple of workshops more in Northern Ontario, kind of at that leading edge of Emerald Ash Borer, uh, but there will be future workshops. As I mentioned, this is a three-year project and we're looking to host workshops over those three years. Uh, so if this isn't in your area, stay tuned for upcoming workshops and I'm sure there will be one close to you that you can get engaged. Um, if not, uh, you can join the Black Ash Inventory Project wherever you are in the province. Uh, we're using an iNaturalist project to help map uh, current locations of black ash. Uh, so you can use kind of our, our online hub once that's available to learn about ash tree identification. And then when you're out on the landscape yourself, uh, you can help to map where black ash is in the province by using this iNaturalist project. Um, these mapping projects help us to kind of use our funding effectively and target our more vulnerable or high risk areas. So even if you see one ash tree and report it, uh, it still is really valuable and important to, um, to our work and for us to be able to use our funds in the most effective way. Okay, next I'm going to talk about the Beech Leaf Disease Monitoring Network. Uh, this is another network that we've kind of started uh, this year as well. Uh, with the foundation of Darissa's Hemophilia Delgid Monitoring Network, we were able to kind of build this community science program up this year uh, and kind of branch out into a few new species. So it's quite exciting. Um, for this Beech Leaf Disease Monitoring Network, we're working quite closely with um, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources Science and Research Branch, uh, who do a lot of the invasive species uh, in the weeds research on, on what's going on with phenology and that kind of things on species like beech leaf disease and oak wilt. Um, so we're working with them um, to develop some, some training for people to identify beech leaf disease uh, and to work on a sampling protocol that will be coming uh, in the spring. But thus far for this program, we have developed also a new fact sheet on beech leaf disease uh, that's available in digital and print formats on our website. We've created some laminated field ID cards uh, that people can take out into the field with them on hikes or uh, if they're out on the landscape for work, whatever it may be. Uh, that's kind of a, a quick guide to look at um, symptoms of beech leaf disease, which I have a few photos on the next slide uh, to kind of help you identify as well if you're not familiar. Um, and we also held our first workshop in early August and we trained 34 community members, municipal staff and conservation authority employees um, on beech leaf disease. We were able to do an infield uh, component to this workshop as well and get out on a local trail and identify some areas that had beech leaf disease. We also did a, a lunch and learn webinar, uh, which is re a recording will be available on our website. 
uh, as well for that one, uh, if you're interested in learning more about beech leaf disease. And during this Lunch and Learn, we launched a reporting campaign, which is still ongoing right now. Uh, so if you're in an area that has beech leaf disease uh, or just beech trees, uh, be on the lookout for this disease and you can add to our reporting campaign until the end of November. Uh, on iNaturalist, there will be a link on the next slide um, and you'll be put in for a, a prize pack, a community science prize pack, if you submit a report. The next steps for this campaign, we're doing some social media posts um, related to just beech leaf disease identification and as well as the reporting campaign in targeted areas along the leading edge of beech leaf disease to try to get a better idea of um, where beech leaf disease really is on the landscape. This is a species that's kind of new and quickly spreading in Ontario. Uh, so this monitoring network and the research um, that it will contribute to uh, is really important for understanding spread dynamics of this species and kind of understanding um, how this species spreads and how we can um, work to mitigate that. We've also developed some educational signage that will be available soon for any organizations that may have beech leaf disease uh, on their public lands that they want to provide information. We'll have a QR code on these um, lawn signs uh, that will link any members of the public that want to learn more to our beech leaf disease monitoring network webpage, uh, which has links to our, our fact sheet, our species profile, uh, past webinars and future upcoming events. And then as I mentioned, we're also working on developing that sampling protocol for community members uh, so they can help to um, support the surveillance and sample collection on the landscape um, that is currently un on underway um, by the MNR staff. Um, so really hoping to support some of that work that's ongoing um, for these types of projects. Um, the on the ground work is really laborious. Um, so having community science be able to support that uh, is really, really helpful to the people that are doing, doing the research. And here you can find um, the link to our reporting campaign on the iNaturalist project. So all you have to do is join the project and make a report of beech leaf disease and you will be added to uh, the campaign or the contest to win a prize. Um, we will be, this will be focused at all of Ontario, um, but we'll be looking especially at areas that are on that leading edge to help support that research. Um, here on the slide, you can see uh, a photo of a beech leaf diseased leaf. Uh, you can see that the main characteristic is kind of a, a curling and crinkling effect of the leaf, along with kind of a striping effect. So what happens is we have uh, this nematode um, that's present um, in the leaves that kind of feed in between these veins. Um, let me get my pointer. So they feed in between the leaf veins here and that's what causes the changes in discoloration and also the crinkling effect of the leaf. Um, so there's new research that has come out quite recently that shows that the nematode feeding effect causes cell cellular changes in the leaf tissue and causes it to become uh, thicker and more leathery. And you can really feel that when you feel a beech leaf diseased um, leaf. So as part of our work with, with the MNR Science and Research Branch, we were able to um, actually extract some beech leaf disease nematodes from diseased leaves and show them at our workshop. So we had the microscopes and we did this all live so people were able to see what the causal agent um, of this disease was. Um, which was really cool. People loved seeing um, what was causing this to happen and, and getting an understanding of what's happening at kind of a, a cellular level um, and really helps to, to get an idea of what's happening um, within the leaf and what's happening to the leaf, being able to see what's causing it. Uh, so that was a really cool thing that we were able to do uh, with the partnership with the ministry and hoping to do this again in the spring. Uh, so please stay tuned for, for more information on that. This nematode also I'll mention is kind of a newly described species um, in North America. So we don't know a lot about 
um, beech leaf disease itself or the nematode that causes it. So this is really important work that um, this group is doing to try to find information about how this species spreads and what we can even do to try to stop its spread and mitigate the effects. Uh, beech trees are, are pretty stressed in the province right now with multiple invasive species impacting them. Uh, so it's really important we get a handle on it as soon as we possibly can. And I'm going to pass it back to Jarissa to talk a little bit about EDMAPS. Um, to give a little bit of flow to this conversation, um, through our beech leaf disease reporting network, uh, we use EDMAPS mainly um, in coordination with our iNaturalist project because our EDMAPS reports go directly to those researchers um, that are doing, doing the work in the lab. Uh, so I'll pass it to Drissa to talk a little bit more about how we use EDMAPS and what the flow to iNaturalist looks like. Yeah, thanks, Mackenzie. So EDMAPS, which is the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System, is a reporting system specifically for invasive species and invasive species only. Um, as Mackenzie mentioned, when you make a report to EDMAPS, that report actually goes directly to the researchers or the experts in that field, so within that kind of taxa. Um, and they will verify that report as, yes, you've made a correct, you know, identification or no, it's actually a common maybe uh, native lookalike or naturalized species or something like that. Um, sometimes they'll even follow up and ask for additional information, especially it, if it is a kind of high priority pest on the landscape, um, then they want to make sure that, you know, it really is that pest and then they can enact a response plan and a management plan or no, it's not few, we, it's, we can kind of disregard that. <laughs> um, but it is a real time tracking system of invasive species and pest occurrences. And you can go, anyone can go onto the website or open up the app and uh, actually see distribution maps of where these pests and other invasive species have been reported. So you can look kind of broad scale across Canada or in North America, um, or you can even zoom in and see like, hey, what's in my neighborhood, um, which is a very helpful tool for all invasive species managers or anyone that's curious. So a lot of municipalities will use it to figure to um, inform their invasive species management plans and things like that. Um, and you can toggle through that using their advanced query tools. Um, so there is, as Mackenzie kind of alluded to, there is a, um, a linkage between iNaturalist and EdMaps. Um, if you do prefer using iNaturalist, you're already using it, or you want to collect data that is uh, of other taxa, not just invasive species. So maybe you also want to know about biodiversity or species at risk and things like that. Um, then by all means, please continue to use iNaturalist. We want everyone to report any way that is most comfortable to them because those reports will still get to people who need to know about them. Um, so if you make a report to iNaturalist, that report goes to an online forum where everyone who uses iNaturalist can view it. And then they, once two people have said, yes, that's what it is and have confirmed that, it, that identification, then it reaches what's called research grade. And research grade reports of invasive species from iNaturalist do get pulled into EDMAPS. They still kind of go through a triage um, verification process um, where our partners at the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters um, will, if it's a higher priority pest, they'll individually look at each report um, to again verify that, that, yes, that's what it is before it gets pulled into EDMAPS. If it is something that is kind of commonplace, then they'll probably bulk upload any research grade iNaturalist observations into EDMAPS. So something like garlic mustard or Japanese knotweed, most people kind of can identify those pretty easily. And iNaturalist does a great job through their, their AI function at kind of picking those ones out because there's so many reports of them in the system. So just to give you an idea of those two, uh, you know, types of systems and how they work, um, you can use either or they're both free to make an account. They both have either a way to report on the web browser or on an application on your phone or tablet or anything like that. And these two platforms are also great ways to be community scientists without even being linked to any specific project as well. So encourage you to check them out if you haven't already. Um, but yeah, I'll pass it back to Mackenzie unless we're done. <laughs> I think that is all we have. I do just have maybe maybe a thank you slide if I can get it up on here. 
Awesome. There we, are. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, thank you very much for for joining us today and listening to us talk about our projects that we're really passionate and excited about and excited to get you involved in. Um, so we'll pass it back to David and have him go through any questions for us. Yeah, so if you have any uh, questions, if you want to type them in the uh, Q&A box or you can either type them into the web chat, uh, that would be... Uh, great. Um, I guess I could start off some of the questions. Oh, wait, we have one here. Uh, general question. Uh, how do you solicit volunteers? Uh, social media, uh, notification on website, uh, tap into conservation authorities and woodlot associations. So this is from Troy Komodo. Yeah, I think maybe I can jump in here. Um, all of the above. <laughs> it really depends on what we're kind of looking for. Um, so, if, for example, during the pilot year of the HWA monitoring network, um, because it was a pilot and we just had a really robust like um, protocol, but not really any visuals yet, we wanted to target an audience that was a little bit more invested in invasive species already and maybe had a little bit more expertise. Um, so we only reached out to our partners at Ontario Woodlot Association um, to kind of reach their members. And then we also reached out to our municipal community of practice to reach uh, conservation authorities and municipalities. So it actually um, was a program that targeted both general uh, public as well as um, municipalities and professionals in the field as well. Um, and that really helped us at least get through some of the bugs of the project before we can open it up and have more materials ready for the general public where we assumed there would be a little bit um, more questions and just needing a little bit of extra um, help to to install those traps and just understand overall what's what the program was about. Um, but then absolutely, I think Mackenzie, you mentioned with the beach leaf disease program, targeting that kind of leading edge front. So when we do things like that, using social media is great because you can put geographic um, kind of areas to any of your, your ads that you post or boosted posts that you make. Um, and then we have our newsletter and blogs and things like that, that we always kind of incorporated into. Um, I don't know how many number of people that we that get those, but I think they're pretty wide reaching as well. But we certainly tap into our networks and our our partners across, like I mentioned, um, Woodlot Associations, Lake Associations, uh, Conservation Authorities, Municipalities, other NGOs, and et cetera. Yeah, I think I could just add that for the beach leaf disease network, we we kind of we looked at targeting that leading edge, as I mentioned. So I looked at kind of either side of the leading edge in Ontario. Um, and then I worked with a conservation authority in the area and had them work with their contacts. And then we worked with our contacts and ended up selling out our, our space very quickly. And we actually had people travel from like a couple hours away to come attend the workshop so it was it was very well attended and with a good group of diverse attendees i'd say excellent um i did have one question that uh might be um darissa might be better at answering this one um what is the percentage of return uh traps that you would get throughout the years. So what's something that people should expect to keep as like a, a buffer zone, I guess? Yeah, and I, I kind of alluded to this. So the first pilot year we received 44 traps total out of the 50 that we um, sent out. And then the second year, I think it was closer to around 80 traps that we received back. 10 of which people did reach out and said like, hey, I, I absolutely couldn't get this trap out. And then there was a handful of people that we just never heard from. Um, but this is definitely something to consider when working with the, with community scientists and general public. Um, I mentioned that the first round of traps, we really did target people who were already kind of invested in this type of work. Um, whereas that second year, we opened it up to a much broader 
um, target of pe uh, target audience. So we got a lot more people who just set it up in their backyard, um, who owned a woodlot, but maybe aren't weren't always super involved in like the Ontario Woodlot Association or things like that. Um, so yeah, I think that that's definitely something to consider. And that might also depend on the audience that you reach out with to. So if it's something that you really need every single trap back or every single um, sample, then you might target more professionals or them or uh, organizations that have trained volunteers that have already done community science projects and things like that. Um, versus if, you know, you'd rather just collect as much data as possible and it's okay if you're missing those gaps, then um, the broader audience is, is definitely still, um, you know, achievable because there's more people out there than just us in, in the field of research. So um, yeah, it just, it depends. Mackenzie, we can see your reminders. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> oh no sorry I was trying to find a slide because as you were talking I just wanted to go back to this slide at the beginning with these bars because I think we could see here what Driss is talking about how oh my god I'm having like all kinds <laughs> of trouble with PowerPoint today I'm sorry everyone I shouldn't have been the one to share slides, I guess. Okay, here we are. So you can see that the motivation for making reports can be impacted by a variety of other things that we can have input into these things, um, which is things like targeting your audience, things like talking about certain impacts that people care about, uh, you know, talking about environmental impacts to certain groups and economic impacts to other groups. So it's really like kind of modeling your response to your audience to get them involved in kind of the way that you want. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, my next question probably would be for Mackenzie. Uh, when you're mapping ash trees, uh, are you targeting all ash trees or just seed producing trees? That is a good question. Um, I would say all healthy ash trees. Is that right, David? I'm gonna I'm gonna flip it back to you. Okay. <laughs> I think the the main idea is to get seed producing trees, but uh, if there are some residual ash trees uh, left available, so I think when it comes to southern Ontario, uh, especially um, in that area, you're looking for both, um, you know, healthy and residual trees or, or trees that are able to produce ash seed, which usually takes a couple of years before they can actually produce uh, seeds. So, yeah, sorry, I guess you. I answered my own question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to flip it back to you to make sure yeah. that that was that was it. But that we do even through that iNaturalist uh, inventory, we really do want to know where where all of the healthy ash trees are. And that helps lead back to um, knowing about genetic diversity. So that'll help lead into that that portion of the project. Uh, so all still important, I would say. Uh, we have another question in our chat box here. Uh, is there interest in monitoring other species of lingering ash or just black ash? And if not, uh, in this project, do you know of any other groups that are tackling other ash um, species lingering ash? Yeah, that's a good question too. I think that I think that having an understanding of where any residual ash is is probably valuable. Um, this project specifically is regarding black ash as it's a species at risk and it's one of the most vulnerable ash species to emerald ash borer. Um, so that's kind of why that species is targeted for this project. Uh, but yeah, I definitely think that having knowledge of um, where those residual ash, tree ash trees are on the landscape is important. and. I'm not sure maybe David would know better of other other projects mapping those other trees, but maybe that could be something we could look into as well to create a similar iNaturalist project that would be 
kind of an easy way, but something to consider definitely. Yeah, so we are also doing the the mapping. Uh, other groups that we're actually working in collaboration with would be the Ontario Forest uh, Research Institute. Uh, they are looking for areas with uh, seed mapping as well. Uh, the Canadian um, Seed Bank, the National Seed Bank, um, is also doing work with uh, mapping of ash trees. And the another group that we're working with is the Forest Gene Conservation Association is also doing um, a, a ash mapping project. So I'll put a last call out for uh, questions. Uh, if you have any questions you want to add in there. Um, I guess one final question for me would be, Mackenzie, you said you have a, a beech leaf disease contest. Um, is there any other places besides the webinar that you can find the link to the contest for people that want to participate? Yeah, you can find it on our website on the beech leaf disease monitoring network website. Um, and you can also search the project on iNaturalist. So all you have to do, if you have know where there's a beech tree with beech leaf disease and you want to like get out and join right now today and get in the contest, um, all you have to do is make a report as you normally would any other iNaturalist observation um, and join the project. And then you'll be entered into the contest. And it's a cool IC branded Yeti with some other community science swag. Um, so it's a cool, I think it's a cool prize. Okay, well, it doesn't seem like you have any more questions. So I would like to thank you once again to Mackenzie and Darissa for participating today. And thank you all for tuning in. I uh, really appreciate that. Uh, this webinar is recorded and will be posted on the InvasiveSpeciesCenter.ca website. Uh, just a reminder to take a couple minutes to fill out the survey at the end of this, and uh, we really appreciate that. Um, our next webinar will be in November, so stay tuned for any updates. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, David. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.